Hello viewers, welcome to Newsweek South Asia, a show where we will provide you fresh insights into South Asia's geopolitical, strategic and security situation. Let's begin the show with the headlines first. Three killed in clashes with paramilitary rangers amid POJK protests. Activists demand end to China's Uyghur and Tibetan oppression. And catastrophic flash floods in Afghanistan claim over 300 lives. Let's begin our show with Pakistan-occupied Jammu and Kashmir, a region long marred by political and social unrest. Recent weeks have seen an alarming escalation in violence and turmoil. The unrest began with clashes between demonstrators and Pakistani security forces, resulting in casualties and injuries. The protesters voicing their grievances over economic hardships especially rampant inflation and frequent power outages, marched through the streets demanding relief measures and increased autonomy. Let's delve into the details in our report. In Pakistan-occupied Jammu and Kashmir, recent weeks have been marked by significant turmoil. Daily life has been severely disrupted due to the violent suppression of protests by Pakistani security forces. Reports indicate that three protesters were killed and several injured when paramilitary troops opened fire. Additionally, a police officer lost his life during the clashes. Thousands attended funeral prayers for victims of clashes in Muzaffarabad POJK. The situation only began to stabilize after the Jammu Kashmir Joint Awami Action Committee a coalition of civil rights groups ended their demonstrations. This decision followed Pakistan's Prime Minister Shahbaz Sharif's approval of an 86 million grant to address some of the protesters' demands, including subsidies on flour and electricity. These protests, among the largest seen in recent years, were fueled by widespread dissatisfaction with the Pakistani government's handling of basic amenities. High electricity tariffs, cuts in wheat subsidies, and a lack of development sparked the unrest. <laughs> Tensions peaked on May 11, when Pakistani police arrested local leaders preemptively to thwart a planned march to Muzaffarabad, a regional capital. This heavy-handed approach, coupled with pre-existing grievances, turned the demonstrators into a full-blown crisis, drawing renewed attention to the long-standing grievances over the colonial and imperial policies imposed by Pakistan in the region. Buying electricity from us at the rate of two rupees and a few pesos and taking all of our electricity to Pakistan's national electricity grid and then they were selling it back to us at different rates between 30 to 60 rupees per unit. How can that be justified? So, on the 9th of uh, May, the Pakistani forces had already entered POJK and uh, Punjab Constabulary, Frontier Constabulary, and that aggravated the situation. People became very angry and took it as a direct insult to their na national pride and started to say that this is an invasion uh, by Pakistan. Then on the, the 9th, arrests started to take place of the leaders of uh, the Long March. And that was the last, you know, point of no return. 
Despite the resolution, the violent clashes and the brutal use of force by security forces have left a deep scar on the community. The brutal suppression of protests, including the firing of live ammunition, tear gas shelling and reports of torture, highlight severe human rights violations. Last year, a similar shutterdown strike occurred, echoing demands for fair electricity pricing aligned with the production costs of Heidel Power in POJK. Once again, despite prior negotiations and a subsequent government notification in February, grievances persisted, leading to the decision to stage a long march in protest against unmet commitments. The first uh, movement in the history of POJK that has had a, an appeal across every section of society. It surpassed the barriers of tribal affiliations, of religion, of political, uh, you know, tendencies. People became one. Ek jut ho gai log. And they said that nothing doing this time. We cannot afford to pay. We will not pay. And so the boycott electricity bill kicked off in August 2023. And uh, people said we are not paying any bills. So they didn't, they stopped paying bills and then they started burning the electricity bills in public. Protests began, sit-ins began, but the government would not listen. People in POJK have realized that after illegal occupation of the Jammu and Kashmir territories in 1947, when the princely state acceded to India-Pakistan, has exploited them to the worst possible limits. Here, people face not only economic hardships, but also political marginalization, especially under projects like the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. The discontent brewing in these regions reflects a deeper yearning for autonomy and genuine presentation. As more people speak out, they are calling for change that goes beyond borders, echoing a universal wish for justice and dignity. Pakistan finds itself at a crossroads, forced to confront the reality of its policies and the aspirations of the people it claims to represent. China's human rights record has been a subject of international concern and scrutiny for decades. The Chinese government's approach to human rights has been criticized on various fronts. As the spotlight intensifies on China's human rights record, activists from diverse backgrounds are joining forces to condemn Beijing's repressive policies. Stay tuned as we delve deeper into the recent developments and the urgent calls for international action on this pressing issue. We have a report. The situation of Uyghur persecution in China is deeply concerning and has drawn international attention. The Uyghurs are a predominantly Muslim ethnic minority group primarily located in the Xinjiang region of China. Reports and testimonies from various sources, including human rights organizations, indicate widespread human rights abuses and repression targeting the Uyghur population. Moreover, the situation in Tibet, particularly regarding human rights and autonomy, has been a long-standing concern. Since China's annexation of Tibet in 1950, there have been allegations of oppression, suppression of Tibetan culture and religion, and restrictions on freedom of speech and movement. At the 2024 Geneva Summit for Human Rights and Democracy, held on May 15, Uyghurs, Tibetans and Chinese political prisoners vehemently condemned Beijing's repressive policies. They highlighted the plight of the Muslim minority in Xinjiang, alleging that as many as 3 million people 
have been detained in camps with women being subjected to forced sterilization. These systematic sterilization practices were characterized as constituting genocide. The people who are uh, arrested in the camp, like now up to uh, 3 million people arrested in the camp, and they like, uh, like uh, sterilized, those ladies sterilized. And I have met a lady, she uh, came to Pakistan in 2008, and uh, because of her, uh, like, uh, husband is a Pakistani, and I interviewed her in 2019, and she said that after, like, released the camp, she couldn't have a baby. She has to uh, go to the doctor. But the doctor said you couldn't have a baby in three years at least. It means that like those people who arrested in the camp and they couldn't have a baby after all. Like systematically sterilization, it is the kind of genocide. And this is a genocide because of people transferred uh, trans, uh, from their original uh, culture and this is a genocide because of the kids uh, separated from their family members. This is a genocide because those Uyghur ladies systematically sterilized. At the summit, the activists were united in urging the international action to put an end to China's violations of human rights against the Uyghurs and Tibetan communities. A 27-year-old Chinese descendant and advocate for human rights shared her distressing account of being detained. She criticized China's treatment of Uyghur and Tibetan populations, characterizing Xinjiang as the largest open prison globally and condemning the widespread censorship prevalent throughout the country. China is really doing devastating human rights reports in the world and they are treating Uyghurs and Tibetans really like animals and the world is turning its eye away from the what's happening in China because in Xinjiang all the Uyghurs are living like in the open prison and it's almost like the most biggest prison in the world and people are not knowing it and in, elsewhere in China the censorship is like it's we have the most strongest censorship machine in the world. Another human rights activist of Tibetan Canadian descent underscored the one sided nature of Chinese documents concerning Tibet, asserting that they consistently represent the viewpoint of the oppressor. She highlights the lack of representation of Tibetan voices and perspectives in official narratives. Any Chinese document that comes out on Tibetan people, you must understand that there's two sides, the oppressor and the oppressed. If the oppressor is talking about the oppressed and making up documents, and no matter what, whether it's about the freedom movement, whether it's about His Holiness the Dalai Lama, whether it's about border issues with India, wherever else, you know that it's coming from the oppressor's side, so that is going to be what? Lies. Nothing but lies that are spewed out by the Chinese government and also by Xi Jinping, no matter where he goes, including Europe that he was recently at. The testimonies and accounts shared at the 2024 Geneva Summit for Human Rights and Democracy shed light on the dire situations faced by the Uyghur and Tibetan communities in China. The widespread human rights abuses including allegations of detention camps, forced sterilization, cultural suppression and censorship underscore the urgent need for international action to address these violations. It is imperative for the international community to stand in solidarity with these oppressed groups and work towards ending the repressive policies of the Chinese government. Indian security forces have intensified their operations to dismantle the intricate network of Pakistan-backed terrorism in the Union territory of Jammu and Kashmir. These proactive measures come in response to Islamabad's persistent and desperate attempts to launch infiltration bids in the region. Despite these aggressive efforts, the Indian Army, in close coordination with the Jammu and Kashmir police, 
remains steadfast in its mission to eradicate terrorism and maintain peace and tranquility in the area. Recently, Indian security forces thwarted a significant infiltration bid along the line of control in Jammu and Kashmir's Kupwara district. In a well-coordinated operation, they successfully neutralized two terrorists attempting to breach the border. We have a report. On May 15, the Indian Army thwarted a significant infiltration attempt along the line of control in Jammu and Kashmir's Kupwara district, neutralizing two terrorists. Acting on specific intelligence inputs, the Indian Army and Jammu and Kashmir police launched a joint search operation in the Amrohi, Tangadhar and Kupwara areas. During the search, the army recovered two pistols, ammunition and other warlike stores. Despite the infiltrators' malicious intent, counter-terrorism operations have effectively subdued terrorism in Jammu and Kashmir. Experts believe these operations have left anti-social elements in Jammu and Kashmir feeling powerless as their logistical and financial support networks are being dismantled from all sides. One thing is very clear, that for any operation to be successful, the complete integration of the police, the local police, the security forces has to be there. Because it is the local police which gets the intelligence from the people. The security forces, whether it is the army, the BSF, CRP and all, they are not interacting with the locals that much. As much as the local police, the local thana, the local constable on the street over there, that is there. And he is the one who is the repository of this information. He is the one who gets the information. Therefore, it is very important for all these people to have a joint operation. That is why the joint operations have been carried out. Repeated attempts by Pakistan to disrupt India's peace are not new. Jammu and Kashmir face continuous violations of ceasefire agreements by Pakistan. Regular drone interventions, dropping illegal weapons and drugs, and local terror associate aiding in terror financing for Pakistan's ill intentions in India. Terrorist infiltration attempts exacerbate the situation. Recently, security forces arrested a Pakistani intruder in a village near the LOC in the Katwa district of Jammu and Kashmir. The intruder identified himself as Zahir Khan, a resident of Karachi. Such intrusions persist even as Pakistan grapples with an unstable economy, rampant inflation, political instability and a military capable of seizing control from civilian governments at will. Meanwhile, the general public struggles to secure basic necessities. The problem with Pakistan is that its own internal problems that are, they are facing in Pakistan occupied Jammu Kashmir, they want to mask that. And masking, they are doing it by increasing the infiltration attempts in Jammu and Kashmir Union territory that is controlled by India. Now, the point is that why are they doing it is so that they can always say that, look, these terrorists are over there, terrorism in Jammu and Kashmir has not been eliminated. And Jammu and Kashmir, because of terrorism, comes more into the news, into the world media, rather than Pakistan occupied Jammu and Kashmir, the revolt that has been taken place by the civilians over there, by the citizens of that place, who are revolting against the Pakistan Muslim, Punjabi Muslim, dominated ISI, the army and the government. And that is why they are saying that they want Azadi now, from Pakistan itself and they want to come back and merge with India. This is what is carrying on in Pakistan and this is what they want to mask and that is why ISI has now given instructions to its, uh, all these terrorists and all who are there in their camps to start infiltration. To counter all attempts and maintain peace in Jammu and Kashmir, India has established a well-structured infrastructure operating round the clock to combat insurgents supported by Pakistan. This ensures that the hard-working people of Jammu and Kashmir can live their lives without disruption. India's multi-level approach includes the BSF shooting down drones delivering drugs and munitions, NIA rates disrupting terror financing networks and a robust intelligence network providing information for police and army counter-terrorism operations. 
This comprehensive strategy maintains peace in the Union territory, despite Pakistan's repeated nefarious attempts. Let's turn our focus to Afghanistan, where flash flood has wreaked devastation on the lives of many. Flash floods caused by heavy rains devastated villages in northern Afghanistan, killing over 300 people and injuring more than 1,600. Villagers buried their dead and aid agencies warned of havoc. The flood has left a trail of destruction across several provinces exacerbating an already dire humanitarian situation in a nation fraught with challenges. Let's take a closer look at the impact of this natural disaster on the people of Afghanistan. Sitting on a mud-sodden tree trunk, Afghan farmer Ghulam Hussain surveyed the devastation across his fields and pondered what his and his family's future will be after an unexpected flash flood on May 12th. The deluge that hit northern Afghanistan destroyed his agricultural land, depositing flood sediments across his farm and his home in Burkha district in northeastern Baglan province. The challenge now is to decide what crop his family can grow going forward. Flash floods have caused mass casualties and widespread devastation in northern Afghanistan as more than 300 people lost their lives and over 1,600 others were injured in the disaster. After intense rainfall, many individuals are unaccounted for as powerful torrents of water and mud swept across villages and agricultural areas in the provinces of Baglan, Takhar, Badaksha and Ghor. This has resulted in a significant humanitarian crisis in Afghanistan a country that is already grappling with the aftermath of several earthquakes earlier this year and severe flooding in March. According to the World Food Programme, Baglan province was one of the hardest hit areas with more than 300 locals killed, thousands of houses destroyed or damaged in the floods. In a statement, the Taliban's economy minister urged the United Nations and private businesses to provide support for those affected by the flooding. Meanwhile, aid groups warn of widening havoc as healthcare facilities and vital infrastructure have also been damaged. For those who have survived like Muhammad Yaqub, their focus is burying the dead. Farmland has been swamped in a country where 80 percent of the more than 40 million people depend on agriculture to survive. Afghanistan is prone to natural disasters and the United Nations considers it one of countries most vulnerable to climate change. The nation, ravaged by four decades of war, 
is one of the world's poorest and one of the worst prepared to face the consequences of global warming. Moreover, following the Taliban takeover after foreign forces withdrew in 2021, it battled a shortfall in aid. That's because development aid that formed the backbone of government finances was cut. This has worsened in subsequent years as foreign governments grapple with competing global crisis and growing condemnation of the Taliban's curbs on Afghan women. And with that, we come to the end of this edition of Newsweek South Asia. We'll be back next week with more news, views and analysis from the subcontinent. Meanwhile, do keep writing to us at nwsa at anin.com. This is Shivangi Mishra signing off on behalf of the entire production team of Newsweek South Asia. Goodbye and take care.